Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you all. It's a nice auspicious occasion. We've got all the photo ops out of the way now. Uh, this is the uh, regular meeting of Thursday, June 6th of the City Council, Library Board, Housing Authority Board, and the City Council representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency. And we call on our Mark Sambito, our Public Works Director, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we have a roll call, please. Councilmember Hobart? Here. Councilmember Kite? Here. Councilmember Smotrich? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Townsend? Here. And Mayor Weil. Here. If you would be so kind as to um, join me in a moment of silence in honor of the tragedy that took place in Orlando over the weekend, and uh, our sympathies go out to those that lost their lives and sympathy to their families. Thank you. The um, first presentation we have is the uh, recognition of a wonderful event for Jackson Lindley, who is being honored today on a wonderful achievement. He has uh, received a terrific scholarship, uh, ROCT, TC. I will ask Staff Sergeant Cindy Jimenez to please join Jackson uh, and Mike Lindley, Jack, Jackson's dad and mother, Dr. Lisa Lindley, please come to the podium. This is a, a wonderful day. Is Chris Alling also here today? Chris, why don't you come up here? Chris is uh, president of the Xavier College where uh, preparatory school where uh, Jackson has attended, and uh, it's quite an auspicious occasion. If you would, Sergeant, please take care of the award. Okay. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. Put the microphone speak, in front of your mouth. Turn, turn it down a little. Sorry. Right. There you there go. You go. Practice. Um, it is a pleasure for me to be here today to represent the United States Air Force and to present the Air Force ROTC scholarship offer. The competition was extremely tough this year. Approximately 800, I mean 8,200 high, high school seniors from across the United States applied for the scholarship slots available. We are extremely selective in awarding scholarships. This year, only 15% of our applicants received a scholarship offer. This student is joining a very special and selective group of young adults. The majority of the Air Force ROTC scholarships covers full college tuition, provides a textbook allowance, and pays most of laboratory fees. In addition to this, a $300 tax-free monthly allowance is paid to each scholarship winner during the academic year, and this amount will increase to $500 by his senior year. The estimated value of a scholarship may exceed $100,000 depending on the student's choice of school and the type of scholarship offered. The end result of and Air Force ROTC scholarship is an officer's commission in the United States Air Force. On behalf of Brigadier General Paul H. Gunner, Commander, United States Air Force, Gene M. Holmes Center for Officer Emissions and Citizen Development, I would like to extend a hearty congratulations and this certificate of recognition to Thomas Jackson Lindley. Jackson, would you like to say a few words? <laughs> All right. How about uh, how about mom and dad? Yo, know, this is Jackson's hometown, and to be here in front of you as Jackson not only launches off to you know, on his Air Force ROTC scholarship, but he'll be attending Yale University in the fall, and to have Chris Alling representing Xavier Prep. 
and the education that they provided, the support that came from this community throughout his life and where uh, his mother and I work and live, we're greatly appreciative. So definitely it is a community effort that achieves something like what Jackson is about to embark on. So thank you all. Well, we're very proud and, and you're a great role model for the young people uh, in our community that are going to be able to view this on RMTV. And uh, we're just delighted that you're here and, and you make us all very proud, Jackson, and we wish you nothing but great success during your tenure at Yale. Thank you very much. And if I could add just one, uh, one comment, uh, there's one part of your education that you're going to miss, unfortunately, uh, <clears throat> not being an enlisted man like I was for four years in the Air Force. <laughs> I did a heck of a lot of KP, and you officers never had to do any KP. <laughs> so accept your good fortune and just remember that those who are beneath you are worthy of your respect because they're cleaning your plate. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you again. Thank you, Thank you Jack. Thank you. The next presentation um, will be handled by Sandra Johnson, our Building and Safety Code Compliance Manager. And this is to Jennifer Heggie and Janice Freeman of the American Cancer Society. And if you would be so kind. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Today uh, is a special day in honor of uh, the City of Rancho Mirage efforts, continuous efforts in raising funds for the American Cancer Society. Uh, at this time, I'd like for Jennifer Hagee and Janice Freeman to come forward, please. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having us here today. Um, as Sandra just announced, um, my name is Jennifer Heggie. I'm the Senior Market Manager for the American Cancer Society in Palm Desert. And I'm with my colleague, Janice Freeman. She's the Relay Manager and was in charge of the Rancho Mirage Relay for Life. And that's why we're here today. And that's to thank you for your amazing participation in the Relay for Life of Rancho Mirage, which you continue to support time and time again. And this was our most successful year as far as participation is concerned. We moved it from Palm Valley School to Rancho Mirage High School, and uh, it was amazing at Rancho Mirage High School. The city of Rancho Mirage raised over $6,000 this year to support our event, so thank you so much for doing that. And since 2013, you've raised over $60,000 for the American Cancer Society. <laughs> so we just want to highlight that we are in the community. We do have a local office in Palm Desert, and you can see up there our amazing Relay for Life event, which we will be doing in February of 2017. It's February 11th, and uh, we're here to ask for your support again, and um, we just wanted to present a couple of awards to you real quickly, and that is uh, awards as a sponsor and awards as our top team that participated in our Relay for Life. So we do have local programs and services that your money goes to, such as transportation here in the Valley, free wigs at our wig bank at Lucy Christie Cancer Center. We have our free 800 number that's available. You know, God forbid if anybody gets diagnosed with cancer and they need to talk to somebody at 2 o'clock in the morning, we are there for you at 1-800-ACS-2345. So Janice is going to uh, hand out your awards, and I am going to turn it over to Andy, who is the uh, program director of the, um, the choir over at Rancho Mirage High School, uh, actually program director of arts and arts and uh, performing, perform performing arts. <laughs> and Andy has a um, wonderful uh, painting that he wants to tell you about that we would like to present to the city of Rancho Mirage. Hi, everyone. Uh, Mayor Weil, Mayor Pro Tem Townsend, and esteemed City Council of Rancho Mirage, the great place that I get to work every day. Um, 
during the Relay for Life, uh, I, was, I was there as the advisor for the choir program, as you've all heard the choirs and seen them around, and the GSA club. We didn't know quite exactly what to offer the American Cancer Society in our first efforts, so we decided to do something that was more of a gift in kind, that uh, was artistic in nature to um, commemorate, to, to uh, give a commemorative piece for the event, and we decided to turn this over to the number one team, which was the city of Rancho Mirage. If we can get three of our amazing young rattlers to bring the piece up. This was the Helene Galen Performing Arts Center first visual artist in residence, Gonzalo Centellas, who I discovered in Barcelona. Uh, cool guy, you remember, um, super social, brilliant artist. Now he's hanging in Helene Galen's USC Rancho Mirage room. And the newest thing that was just framed, um, art at the first gallery had it framed as also a gift. And this was painted the day of the event um, as a commemoration of the Relay for Life 2016. And we proudly present it on behalf of Performing Arts, GSA Club, and the American Cancer Society to the great city of Rancho Mirage. Oh, and I just have to say, go Rattlers. Go Rattlers. Go Rattlers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I'm not sure where we will put it, but wherever it is, it will be. It will be proudly displayed. Uh, it was a wonderful event. Uh, many of us were out there that day, and uh, we're thrilled. And Sandra did a great job, uh, as always, organizing it. So thank you loads, and uh, we're honored to have the, uh, the picture. Sandra? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I could have Council Member uh, Kite and the Mayor come down, please, for this presentation. Sandra, while they're on their way down, if I could just make a couple of comments. The uh, Relay for Life program was initiated by the city's employees to participate in the Relay for Life program, and Sandra Johnson was our team captain and has been for the last three years. At the last program at 8 o'clock at night, they invited Sandra up to give the, the final speech, and her speech uh, was a motivational speech about caregiving and how important caregivers are um, in the um, in the cancer fighting team in families and friends circles of families and friends so um, I was moved and I was proud of Sandra and the rest of our staff thank you Sandra thank you. Andy um, could you start the PowerPoint for me I just want to go through a, a couple quick slides to kind of culminate what uh, Randy has said about the event this year was at Rancho Mirage High School um, uh, this is our second year here at the high school. Uh, prior to that, as it was mentioned, we were at Palm Valley. Next slide. Um, we've been participating now in American Cancer Society Related for Life for four years now. Um, this is a sample of the teams um, that we've had in those four years. And as she stated, we've raised over $30,000 between the city staff and city council. Um, this was our team this year. Um, I'd like to recognize a couple pe pe people in the picture and that are in the audience today of our team uh, members as we move along. Next slide, please. There's Mr. Uh, Richard Kite, who also did one of the uh, uh, speeches there and uh, announcements at the onset of the uh, relay. On a, again, a couple of the highlights, over 500 participants, 28 survivors, 34 teams, $28,000 in our city raised over $6,000 of that $30,000. Thank you again to the city council and staff members who helped make that happen. And here are our team members. A few of them are in the audience today and I'd like to recognize them. My co-captain, uh, my kickstand, I couldn't have done it without her, Ma'am Gotchox. Bill, Eno, Bill Enos is in the audience as well. Pamela Berkey, Brian Kephart. I, I think it's worth mentioning that we also had some of our executive team, Mr. Richard Kite, Ted Weil, Randy, Isaiah, Mark, Robert, and David all participated. So again, thank you to uh, American Cancer Society. It was a great uh, team event. We really enjoyed ourselves, and we look forward to next year with the participation of the council. And uh, go Rattlers and go City of Rancho Mirage. So thank you. <laughs>
before Sandra gets out of here, I think uh, it's, it's only appropriate that um, we really show our support for what she's done over the last couple of years. She's made the program what it is now, and it's just going to get bigger and better every year. We've got such great support from the high school. Uh, it was really great to see how many kids were out there, and the program was bigger and better, and we look forward to next year. You did a great job. Go Rattlers. Go Rattlers. <laughs> I didn't either. That's, yeah, that's a new symbol for me, but I can understand it. The, uh, the next presentation is the recognition of the finance department receiving the 2015 CAFR Certificate of Achievement of Excellent in Financing Reporting. And of course, the recipient is going to be Isaiah Hagerman, our Director of Administrative Services, and Councilman Kite will do the honors, who is a member of our Budget Subcommittee. Richard? Thank you, Mayor. It's really a pleasure for me to announce that the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting has been awarded to the City of Rancho Mirage by the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada. Their Certificate of Achievement is the highest form of recognition in the area of governmental accounting and financial reporting, and its attainment represents a significant accomplishment by the government and its management. This is the 25th Certificate of Achievement of financial reporting that the City of Rancho Mirage has received. So at this time, I'd like to have Isaiah Hagerman, the Director of Administrative Services, join me at the po podium. Isaiah? Well, number 25, so we only got, what, 25 more to go, huh? done a great job. Financial uh, department has obviously been one of our strong points over the last 25 years. We have the uh, certain we have the award here. And the award says certificate of achievement and for excellence in financial reporting presented to the city of Rancho Mirage for its comprehensive annual financial report for fiscal year ending June 30th and it's signed by the executive director and CEO. So uh, congratulations, we look forward to more uh, good reporting in the future. Yeah, the city has a long proud history of receiving this award, this is the 25th time. And uh, I'd like to thank the entire city council for the high level support and oversight that you provide during the process. Uh, what this award does is it requires the government to put additional information within their financial statements to benefit the users of those financial statements. It is an elective program. You don't have to do it. Uh, if you choose to do it, it shows that you're taking the extra steps to make sure that your financial statements uh, are accurate and carry the best information. Uh, the award actually ships our financial statements off to an independent uh, review from a CPA. Most of the time, these CPAs are outside the state. Uh, the benefit to the city is you have an independent CPA reviewing our financial statements and they give us comments every year on how we can make those financial statements better. So being that this is our 25th time receiving this award, uh, we've gotten better every time. So thank you to the city council uh, for your support and to the budget subcommittee uh, for everything that you do throughout the year because that's really what it takes to get this award. I'd also like to uh, recognize my staff. Uh, we have a great staff here at the city that is dedicated to their purpose uh, in finance. That is the protection of the city financially, and it would not be possible without the fantastic staff that I have, and I'm going to introduce them right now. So uh, first off is Jesse Eckenroth. He's our finance manager. <laughs> then we've got Ted Stoner, who's our senior accounting tech. We've got Annie Sanfilippo, who is our accounting tech. 
Anna Leon, who is an accounting tech. And then our newest addition to the city of Rancho Mirage is our senior accounting technician over at the library, Heather Lazat. And Heather's job is a tough one because she actually has two bosses. So she reports to the library director and she also reports to me on the finance side. And uh, Heather's position works closely with our 501c3s and the library budget. So this is our finance team that we have here at the city. Well, congratulations. We indeed feel that we have an outstanding finance department. We're very proud of it. Thank you for all the hard work that you do. Uh, we will now go to the non-agenda public comment. Uh, we have one request, Dan Levinson. and staff. Um, I'm here representing Rancho Mirage Country Club once again. I have uh, attended every meeting here at City Hall since last July with the exception of two meetings. And uh, anyway, I, I want to thank all of you for listening to and putting up with our problems that we've had over there and knowing what they are. And I especially want to express my thanks to Sandra Johnson, who's pretty popular today. Maybe you ought to consider June 16th every year as Sandra Johnson Day. <laughs> but anyway, she has prepared a, um, an abatement cost report relative to the problems that we're having uh, with respect to certain items over at uh, Rancho Mirage Country Club with the current owner. And uh, it was very professionally done. In fact, I mentioned to her in the hall that she would not be out of line to be appointed to the Supreme Court of the United States. She's that good. <laughs> At any rate, um, I had a whole list of things to go through with you today. And as I walked down the hall from back where her office is with her, I got answers to everything on my list. So I don't need to crimp you out with time. The only item that we weren't able to find out, but she said she would notify me is that uh, when the date of the trial or hearing, whatever it's going to be, is between the city and Oasis Ranch LLC, which owns the Ranch of Mirage Country Club. And uh, Mr. Quintanilla suggested that we talk to Ben, that he was around, but I don't see him anywhere, so he must be hiding out. So anyway, but Sandra said she'd let me know. So everything's good. And thank you so much for your patience over the past year. And uh, people where I live, even though they don't always come to meetings and do things, they have expressed their sincere thank you for everything that you people have done. And this shows you what a really class act city Rancho Mirage is. So thanks again. Thank you. Are there any other um Public comments? If none, we will go to the City Council uh, board member comments. I'll make uh, one briefly that um, on July 4th, the um, Ago Caliente uh, Casino and Resort will have a fireworks display. Uh, the casino, as you know, is at 32250 Bob Hope. The general uh, the fireworks will begin at 9 o'clock. There is parking available for the general public in the vacant lot south of the main hotel. There are 500 reserved places for Rancho Mirage residents uh, with a, um, a city reserve valet parking placard. If you don't have one, you can get it at City Hall uh, with proof of residency. The um, 
There will be food and beverage available for purchase. Lawn chairs and blankets are allowed. There are no pets permissible, as you know, fireworks do disturb and upset animals. It is a fabulous, fabulous show, and I think all of our residents will enjoy it greatly. So I thank you. And with that, uh, I will turn to our council members. Charlie, would you? I have nothing right now, thank you. Iris? I do have something, uh, and Josh will help me on the screen here. Uh, because in light of last week's 5.2 magnitude earthquake and then the one this morning that registered about 3.2, I felt the need to remind everyone of the importance of being prepared for a disaster. So I have put together a few pictures of items that Tom and I have gathered at our home to ensure our readiness if and when disaster strikes. Mm -hmm. So this is part of what our website looks like. As you can see, we have food, water, a portable air conditioner, a generator, and a supply of gasoline. The solar power packs shown on the left side of this slide are really great. You can change your phone, you can charge your phone, iPad, or other mobile devices, which you will most definitely need to be kept informed on update, disaster updates. The tarp, the rope, purification tablets, and a multi-use transfer pump can also come in handy and should always be kept in your home or garage. And last but certainly not least is the portable toilet and shower. They're amazing devices and uh, they will be a tremendous help. So for more information on supplies, as well as many other emergency preparedness resources, please go to the city's website at www.ranchomiragega.gov. Scroll down a bit and click on the emergency preparedness image as shown here, and you will be directed to the emergency preparedness plan, prepare, and stay informed webpage. You can also go to www.ranchomiragepreparedness.org to get to that page. Here you will be able to access all the information you will need to make sure that you, your family, and your pets are well prepared for whatever disaster may come your way. This is the handiest device and gadget that we have in our emergency supplies, and I'll demonstrate it in just a moment. It is a manual emergency power station. It's a flashlight, a radio, a siren, and a cell phone charger all in one. No batteries, no electricity needed. And you can get one at uh, any one of the good hardware stores around your neighborhood. So now some of these supplies, such as the portable air conditioner and the generator, give me the perfect segue to talk about something that is affecting a lot of our residents lately. And I am referring to planned and even unplanned power outages occurring in our city during these hot summer months. Southern California Edison sends out outage notifications at least two weeks prior to planned outages. So residents can make the necessary arrangements, whether it's staying with friends or relatives, going to a hotel, the mall, or movies, or a cooling center near you, which by the way is also on our plan, prepare, and stay informed webpage, just until power is restored and you can comfortably be at home. However, some of our residents may not have the option to leave their home or may not have relatives living close by to assist them. So, having a generator and portable air conditioner are certainly an asset in these situations. And if you happen to live in an uh, HOA, you might want to talk to the uh, board of directors from your HOA to see if generators are available on these very uh, unplanned and very hot occasions. Um, and if you would like to find out about outages in your neighborhoods, 
you have four options available. Go to SCE's website at sce.com slash reliability. Number two, call 800-611-1911. Number three, email them at scepoc at sce.com or refer to the SCE outage notice you receive. Also, the SCE's website is a great resource for residents. As you can see circled in blue, you simply enter your city, county, zip code, or the outage number, which is listed on the SCE notice to view all information regarding outages in your particular area. Also on that page, you will see circled in red, want to be notified? Click on manage alert preferences. Either register or if you are already online with SCE as a customer, log in with your SCE user ID and password and you will receive your planned power outage notifications via emails. And if you are not already on our city's email blast list, please do yourself a favor, give this city a call, give them your email address, and we will place you on our e-blast list. We keep everyone as updated as possible with events taking place in our city, uh, as well as the emergency events that might occur. So, thank you so much. Please tune in to whatever you can to make yourself safer, and we look forward to a nice summer and hopefully no outages. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Richard? Nothing. Dana? Nothing. We will then go to the, um, the minutes. Does the council have any additions or deletions to the minutes? Move approval of the minutes. Second. Please vote. The uh, motion is approved uh, five to zero. Yes, Iris, do you want to uh, add something? And one of the most important things I forgot to show you, because I really believe in show and tell, and this is the device that is the emergency power station. And all you do is wind it up. <coughs> You've got a flashlight, a radio, a siren, and a place to charge your cell phones. So make sure you get something like this. If you don't get anything else, get this and lots of water. Thanks. Iris, how often do you have to wind that? <coughs> Whenever it feels like it. <laughs> it's good go to the gym. <laughs> That's my exercise for That's the day. It is a great device, thank you. It is. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. All right, we'll go to the uh, consent calendar. I will, um, I will have item number three pulled, and uh, the consent calendar will be handled by our city manager, Randy Binder. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council. You have uh, four items on your consent calendar today, uh, in addition to the one number three that was pulled. Item number one on consent is a request to dispose of surplus library equipment uh, that's left over from the uh, remodeling and upgrading of the uh, conveyor belt system. And that is uh, proposed to be approved with resolution pursuant to the city's disposal policy. Number two on your consent calendar is final acceptance of improvements for tract 36235. That's Ravel. That's a 32 lot residential subdivision. Uh, on the um, north side of Clancy Lane, west of Monterey Avenue. About half of the houses have been built already. Uh, the city staff has inspected the private and public improvements associated with that tract and find that they've been con constructed in accordance with the city's um, design guidelines and the city council imposed uh, conditions of approval. Item number three is pulled. Item number four are contracts. And item number five, our demands. We're recommending approval of your consent calendar uh, with a small amendment request to pull number five of the contracts list and refer it to the SAF subcommittee for detailed review. We're here to answer any questions. Uh, Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, I believe we are also uh, pulling an item 
from uh, the contracts, number five? Yes, that would be included in, in our amended request for your motion. <clears throat> okay. Right. Any other comments regarding the uh, consent items? Seeing none, uh, I'll call for, uh, well, are, are there any, any questions at all from the audience? Seeing none, I will uh, call for a motion to approve the consent calendar items one, two, four, and five. Second. Please vote. The items are approved five to zero. We will return to item, consent item number three, Randy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll turn this over to our engineering technician, Jeff Benson, who put together the staff report and will make his first presentation at a council meeting. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Good afternoon, and thank you, Honorable Mayor and City Council. Staff is requesting City Council approval on this resolution, which would designate and authorize three city employees to execute and submit funding applications for emergency financial relief through the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services. This is for a three-year period. These individuals include the City Manager, the Director of Administrative Services, and the Director of Public Works. Staff recommends that City Council approve this resolution and sign Cal OES Form 130 so that Cal OES can have these authorizations on file to expedite funding approval in the case of a major emergency. This concludes my staff report, and I will be glad to answer any questions you have. Does council have any questions? No. Seeing none, I'll call for a motion to approve item number three on the consent calendar. So moved. Second. Well, it's really not a, you know, open from a public standpoint, but does anybody from the public have any comments? Seeing none, the motion is on the floor, and I'll call for a vote, please. And the item number three on the consent calendar is approved five to zero. Next item is, a, uh, is the CV link. Dana, do you have an update of any kind? <clears throat> yes, very briefly. On June 27th, the last uh, Monday in this month, uh, will be the culmination of a four-year if not longer, plan by CVAG and those who are behind the CV link uh, to have operations and maintenance and some building uh, construction costs be paid from the Measure A fund uh, that uh, we get in the Coachella Valley uh, annually as a result of our one half cent increase in sales tax. Uh, there will be a motion on the uh, executive committee agenda on the 27th to approve placing certain items, including CV Link, on the TIPS, T-P-P-S, uh, list, which up to now has had nothing on that list except roadways, intersections, bridges needing uh, repair uh, of some sort. It's always been what major A funds have been used for, for the repair of our horrible roads, and uh, if this motion passes uh, on the 27th by the executive committee of CVAG, uh, the TIPS list will have not only uh, roads and bridges and highways and that sort of thing, but they'll also have as being eligible for funding the CV link. And it's been proposed by some that as much as a million dollars a year be taken from that fund to pay for operations and maintenance of uh, CV Link. Uh, the voters of <clears throat> uh, Riverside County, both in 2000, 1988, I think it was, and 2002, approved Measure A funds and expressly, uh, with respect to the Coachella Valley, approved them for repair and uh, improvement of uh, arterial roads and highways. Uh, this will be a major departure from uh, the customary use, and I might say all because of the politics of CV Link. They can't raise the money on their own. They want the CV Link, they should be able to pay for it 
without dipping into the repair funds that we have accumulated and accumulate on an annual basis. In addition to the cost of annual operations and maintenance, the uh, TIPS list will also have another category added if this motion passes, and I have no doubt that it will pass. Uh, there hasn't been a single item that has been requested by Tom Kirk, the executive director, in the last four years having to do with CV Link. It wasn't passed by uh, the um, executive council. So this will pass, but <clears throat> additional to the cost of CV Link at $100 million, they are going to be adding another $100 million of bicycle lanes, painting, and that sort of thing. So approximately $200 million will be added to the roadways that uh, are clearly under repaired at the moment and have been for a long time and will on projection be uh, in disrepair for many decades considering that we only get about $19 million a year right now from uh, Major A uh, tax proceeds coming into uh, the uh, Coachella Valley. So this is a very serious turn of events and uh, we had always thought that it was going to be, yes, the $100 million uh, for CV Link for the construction of it, but now we find that they've added another $100 million of uh, bicycle lanes and adjacent lanes that anybody who wants to connect to the uh, CV Link, all of that will be eligible for Major A funds. Um, seems to me to be a, uh, a very serious departure from good government, but it is what it is. So I just wanted to bring you up to date. We will be there. Our city uh, will vote against it. And there might be at least one other city that does. But the rest of them will fall in line. Dana, would you comment on how this affects our city? Well, it affects our city in this way. While we have voted 80% roughly to not participate the CV link, it doesn't mean that we don't have uses for roadway repair funds. We do. Uh, the money that we have come to expect in roadway projects from Major A funding comes through CVAG to the city. Uh, already we have actually one instance of uh, uh, one of the bills that we have submitted that had roadway had a commitment uh, to be uh, partially paid by uh, Measure A funds through CVAG has already been rejected in the form of being placed on a separate list where it's going to end up waiting for a while. Uh, arguably that's punishment to Rancho Mirage for our opposition. How dare we oppose uh, the CV link? But um, that is one of the, uh, Randy, what is that? Was it for the bridge or was it for the roadway out front? I was, was it the, I think it was the intersection of Frank Sinatra and Highway 111. Right, just right out front here. We have, uh, we had been told that we would be reimbursed for the improvement of that intersection to make it two lanes turning and all of that that's gone on. Uh, Isaiah, how much money uh, has been deferred now that we thought we were going to be paid? Uh, it's about $534,000. So that's a debt that uh, we now have. They, they have a debt to us. Instead of us getting that $500,000, uh, they're sitting on it. Uh, so all the politics of CVAG which uh, was an organization that, in my view, has deteriorated significantly, and we hope to be part of the effort to bring it back to, 11 key, uh, to an even keel. Um, so that basically is it. You know, I'm sure that at the meeting after uh, June 27th, that we'll be reporting to you that this distortion of major A funds has been passed by the uh, Coachella Valley Association of Governments Executive Committee. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Dana. And I might, I might add that if one reads the, 
the newspaper, the Desert Sun, on a regular basis. You'll read letters to the editor from many cities that are asking to be heard, that are employing their councils to give them an opportunity to vote on this issue, just as we have done in Rancho Mirage, and it appears that Indian Wells will do the same. And it is quite unfortunate that uh, the constituents of these other cities so far have been silenced, which is uh, too bad because it's contrary to the democratic process. So I thank you. Uh, the, the next item on the, uh, will be the adoption of resolutions approving the City Library and Housing Authority. And Isaiah, Isaiah Hagerman, our Director of Administrative Services, will be handling that. Isaiah? If I could make him some introductory comments first. Absolutely. Mr. Mayor. Uh, so at this time last year, the staff and the city's budget subcommittee had presented a two-year budget to the city council. You'll recall that you approved the first year and tentatively approved the second year budget. Uh, we all know that revenues and expenditures uh, change year to year and need to be adjusted as, as the economy um, dictates. The tentative approval that the council gave for the second year budget allows the city to come back and revise and update it to be more responsive to the needs of the community that we all serve. So we began this year's budget refinements with a mandate to uh, every department uh, director and, and manager to reduce expenditures where possible. They came back and responded well and they met my challenge. Uh, next we re uh, presented the uh, draft budget to the budget subcommittee. We had two meetings, each one about two or three hours long, and uh, several other, other modifications were made. And then finally, we went through two workshops with the full city council, and the final refinements were put into this year's budget. So that brings us to today. And uh, as you know, I oversee the budget process, but really my director of administrative services, Isaiah Hagerman, he's the real budget hero. So at this time, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Hagerman, and he can uh, present the complete budget overview for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Binder. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, this is our fiscal year 16-17 budget, and as uh, Mr. Binder indicated, this is the second year in our two-year budget cycle, and so uh, the City Manager led a review, uh, which we then took that result to the Budget Subcommittee, uh, which consists of Councilman Kite and Councilman Hobart. Uh, I would like to thank you guys uh, for putting up with those very long and tedious meetings. Uh, your guidance and direction during in those meetings are uh, very much appreciated. All right, so let's get into it. Where are we at? Uh, for our general fund, this is our main operating fund of the city. Um, we started out with a preliminary budget, so that was after the city manager-led uh, review and the input from the budget subcommittee, and that preliminary budget was released on May 25th. After that, we gave uh, about a week period, and we had two full council budget study sessions that were open public meetings, and that's the middle column. So the results of those study sessions were, we did not make any changes to operating revenues, but we did add some operating expenditures. And the end result, the budget that you see before you today is the far right column. Uh, so we are estimating an operating surplus of just over a million dollars. How did you make that bounce? Yeah. <laughs> well, I liked I it to bounce because thing. we kind of bounce around in the budget process, but we ultimately end on a number. But <laughs> why is it red? Pretty impressive, I'd say. <laughs> Black would have been better. All right, so uh, let's take a look at uh, just some high-level charts of where our revenues come from and uh, how we're spending our money. So uh, this chart is a pie chart that dictates where the general fund revenue is coming from. We're just under 24.8 million in revenue. And you'll notice that over 50% of the general fund's revenue is coming from sales tax and bed tax, or otherwise known as TOT. Uh, that is significant for us. This is how we live and breathe from a financial standpoint. We are very tourism driven. We are a low, no property tax city. Uh, so if you live in our city, that does not mean your property taxes are any lower. It just means the city gets a lower share of the amount you're paying. And uh, 
one of the uh, items that the city council initiated in 1990 was a communities facilities district charge and that is a charge on new development to mitigate the impacts on our public safety services and down at the bottom that's our third largest revenue in our general fund. That is a very significant item for our city in trying to keep up with the increases that we're seeing from our public safety and the impacts of new development on our safety services. This uh, chart dictates or uh, uh, illustrates where our money is spent. Uh, of course, uh, the theme throughout this budget process was public safety. Uh, so that $9.5 million in public safety, that represents the sheriff and a $2 million subsidy for our fire services. Uh, the other departments are broken up by function, so public works is pretty self-explanatory. Our land use uh, is really the uh, planning, building, and code functions. We have the general administrative services for the city, that's HR, admin staff, IT, finance. Then we have our executive services, that is the city manager and the city council. We have our general government category, uh, that is really uh, items that we cannot associate with one of the other services. Then we have marketing and our economic development, uh, and then our special programs. So public safety uh, during our two budget study sessions were, it was definitely the most significant item, and uh, Rancho Mirage is not unique in this challenge. Uh, this is something that is challenging every city right now. Um, really what we're talking about is we have had some massive increases annually from public safety. And really we've heard the last few years that cities are not going to be able to keep up with these increases. Um, it is unsustainable the path that they are on and the increases we are receiving. And these increases aren't driven by increases in level of service. This is just to maintain what we had before so the safety personnel and level of service we had the year before we're seeing seven eight percent increases now multiple years in a row and a little later in the presentation we did some forecasting and that is definitely the largest concern is as you saw for this budget before you we have a million dollar operating surplus so we are okay right now but our concern was really going forward and if these unsustainable increases continue, uh, the pressure that is uh, going to put on all cities. So this budget, uh, what you have before you, so included within all the numbers, uh, we are adding a new uh, medic, a new ambulance service out of fire station number 50, that is the fire station on Highway 111, and that service will start uh, January 2017. Uh, the fiscal impact for the 16-17 budget is uh, $447,500, and that's a half year of operation. So when we go to do our next two-year budget cycle the year after, uh, the full year operation operation cost for that new ambulance, for the staffing of that new ambulance, is uh, around $900,000 a year. Uh, on the sheriff's side of the house, um, we uh, analyzed several different uh, options and we ultimately uh, resulted in a way to maintain and actually enhance our level of service but also realize some budget savings. So what this uh, sheriff proposal does is uh, we're keeping a dedicated sergeant position um, and we're swapping deputy time for uh, community service officer time. Essentially, uh, the community services officers are great for our type of community. Uh, they do assist the deputies and keep them on the higher level functions. Uh, but when you see our community services officers, they're the ones many times out in our community. They're on our streets. Um, they work closely with all of our gated communities. And they really assist the deputies in carrying out their high, higher level roles. So for a community like ours, we get a lot of value from our CSOs. So we are swapping deputy time for or community service officer time. So under this proposal, uh, basically the net reduction to our budget was just over $300,000 with adding a full-time CSO and uh, the sergeant position. So our staffing levels, uh, what's it look like? We carry three shifts. Uh, so the column on the left is how we operate now. The column on the right would be if this budget is approved and we made the changes as part of this budget. 
So as you can see, the proposed on the right uh, side of the slide, we highlighted in red the differences between the two columns. Uh, so really what we're seeing is a budget reduction of $300,000, yet we're actually increasing the level of service on our streets by increasing the personnel on there. So during the, uh, there's no uh, changes for the uh, graveyard shift, uh, for watch two, the day shift, uh, it'll change from three deputies down to two, but then we're increasing the CSOs and the day coverage on the CSOs. And as I mentioned before, those CSOs really support the deputies and keep them on the higher level functions. Uh, and it keeps them eligible to respond to the higher level calls that CSOs can't do. So they alleviate some of that lower level work so that they can stay active. And then uh, down at the bottom, the uh, swing shift, uh, the change there is just an increase in the number of CSOs and the days of coverage. So during the budget, um, we spent a lot of time talking about the future and, and what do we see from public safety and uh, really that's part of the reason why we do a two-year budget is we do like to forecast out to make sure that if we have a structural problem, we start to identify that early and the city can make decisions and uh, uh, figure out solutions early enough. So this is a chart that you saw in the uh, budget uh, study sessions and what this does is this is the services component. So this isn't, you know, maintenance of fire stations, equipment, uh, professional technical type items. This is truly just services. So these are the bodies that we pay for, for both fire and uh, sheriff. And so starting on the left hand side of the screen, we give some actuals. And so you can see in 14-15, we had a 10.5% increase in public safety. That was 1.1 million. In the current fiscal year that's getting ready to end, uh, we're estimating about an 8.1% increase. And then this budget, 1617, which is the green highlight on the screen, we're projecting as the budget sits now a 10.1% increase, just under 1.3 million in this budget. Now, everything going forward, the last three columns are the projections. So what we did is the yellow assumes a 7% increase. That is in line with what we've been getting. The orange assumes a 5% increase. So if they lower the increases that we've been seeing the last few years, that would be 5%. And then the blue is a 3% estimate on if they just basically cut it in half of what we've been seeing. From a planning standpoint, uh, we've been told that we can expect higher level increases. So internally, we are looking at the 7%, which is the top yellow item. So what you can see on the screen, and I'll, I'll highlight it here, is essentially going forward, the city can expect to pay a million dollars more each year just to keep what we had the year before. So we're going to see a million dollar increase every year. So what I'm highlighting here is uh, next March when we start to do our next two year budget cycle, this is potentially what we're looking at from a public safety standpoint. So in year one, in 1718, uh, we at a 7% increase, public safety services would increase by 965,286. In the next year, it increases by just over a million dollars. But you'll see the, uh, the red uh, there at the bottom that says two-year budget impact. We're going to have a $2 million increase by the second year just to keep the level of service that we've had. This is, and then the year after that, the third year, that's going to be a $3 million running total. So this is what is when we say these increases are unsustainable, our revenues will not grow like that. We're a $24.8 million budget, and within a three-year period, we're possibly adding $3 million just for public safety. This is what is meant by these increases are unsustainable. Uh, so really, our concern on a go-forward, um, and I think our job, we've got some work to do, but this is uh, right now the biggest concern from a budget standpoint. This chart um, really just summarizes in total. Uh, so at the end of the day, 
Uh, we have some rather large capital expenditures. Uh, this shows the general fund in a summary. Uh, so what are our reserve balances? How are we using those reserves over the course of the 16-17 fiscal year? So that's the uh, far right column. So these are the numbers that we've seen. And essentially, we have 10 million in capital expenditures. Uh, it's 5 million for the Ritz Spa Suite purchase and 5 million for the sec Section 19 water agreement. Uh, so that's down in the bottom hand, uh, right hand corner of the screen. So essentially, we're estimating to go from 66 million in reserves uh, at the end of the 16 17 budget year. We're going to be down about 10 million, so down to 55. 0.8 million in reserves. Now, one thing to note is the two most significant items from a capital standpoint, uh, the Rich Spa Suites and the Section 19 Water Reserve. Uh, there is an outflow of resources, so we account for the whole thing going out, uh, but both these amounts will be returned to the city under each of their respective agreements. And with that, uh, that concludes my presentation, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Are there, uh, does council have any questions? Yes, Isaiah, aren't the other cities looking into the increases <coughs> as a whole, doing like a, uh, a uh, formal look at what they can do as cities are joining together to offset these major increases? So there have been some cities that contract with Riverside County that are looking at feasibility studies of starting their own uh, police force or fire. Um, the city of Ranch Mirage has not participated in those. We're a, a rather small city. It's mainly the, the larger cities like Moreno Valley uh, on the west end of Riverside uh, County where it's really sustainable or an option for them. Any other questions? I'll ask the um, open it to the public, and does the public have any questions regarding the budget? Uh, obviously, it's very complex, very detailed, um, but we welcome any questions that you might have. Seeing none, I will close the public portion and ask for council comments again. Yes, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I will make a motion. I do want to make some comments, though, that uh, primarily echo what uh, Isaiah has told us, starting in the back part. Um, every year we raise the question of whether or not we would be better off having our own police or fire department. Every year we feel that we would not. Uh, anybody who looks at any of the cities that have their own police and fire will see that uh, the increases that they incur from year to year are substantially more than what we've incurred. Uh, also, when you have your own police and fire, uh, they, the politics uh, of the cities tend to, uh, um, well, tend to change in that uh, sometimes when raises are sought, police and fire threaten strikes, things of that nature that we don't have to deal with. Uh, so by and large, I think uh, uh, that the, that the process that has begun long ago in Rancho Mirage uh, is a process that we should continue, and that's uh, working with the county in uh, staffing our police and fire services. Uh, <clears throat> over the past uh, month or two, uh, you've seen articles in the newspaper where council members uh, rant to some large extent about the increase in fire and uh, police safety expenses. Um, and we're not doing that. We, we don't like the raises any more than anybody else does. But we have spent a lot of time questioning our police and fire uh, leadership uh, to uh, get an understanding of why the budget is what it is. And uh, we've gone so far in our discussions as to find out what the hourly income is of a fireman uh, or police officer uh, as to what he's taking home and comparing that to other cities. Uh, and as, as a constant, uh, we uh, have fared much better being under the uh, county system uh, that we're under. Uh, the problem that we face is that we're going to have these increases now for 
the next one, two, three cycles, maybe more, of, of 7% increases. Well, that's, that's a major impact uh, on, uh, on our reserves, and it's a major impact on our income, trying to find ways to uh, deal with that, uh, those kind of numbers. Um, I do believe that we are going to have to start searching for additional uh, sources of revenue to pay for these increases that we are going to be dealing with. French Mirage has a reputation of providing uh, uh, superb services to uh, the residents, and uh, we don't want to get to the point where we start reducing the services that we uh, offer to our, uh, our residents because of increases in fire and safety. We, we will never compromise on the fire and safety requirements for our city. There's just no way we're going to do that. Ours is as safe as cities get. None become uh, impenetrable from crime or fire, ambulance services and so forth. But uh, we, uh, uh, we will face problems in the near future, two years uh, and thereafter. Uh, and uh, my hope is that we will uh, search for ways to uh, get additional revenue so that our services are not impacted. It's going to be a very delicate uh, uh, situation, and uh, we're going to have to look at some issues very hard and take some realistic positions, posturing about how tough we are and all blah, blah, blah. Posturing is not going to cut it. Uh, this is reality, and uh, it's uh, a side of reality that uh, uh, representatives in government don't like to face. But we have to face it, and this council, I believe, will face it. And uh, without the hyperbole and the swag and the malarkey that goes with, uh, uh, with the entire picture. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mayor, I'd like to make a motion uh, at this point, and we can discuss Dana, it further. Can I make a comment sure. first before you do that? Mr. Mayor, can I yes, make please. a comment? Thank you. Uh, Dana and I both sat on the uh, subcommittee for the budget process, and, and it was very enlightening as we went through and looked at all our uh, expenditures and revenues. And uh, we were, I think, uh, doing negotiations with the public uh, safety uh, partners all the time as we look for a solution for both the city and the public uh, safety partners. Uh, I just want to thank the representatives that worked with us so closely uh, from Riverside County Sheriff's Department, Captain Sue Trevino and Lieutenant John Shields. They were both very much involved in, in the process of looking at the uh, sheriff's cost. And representing CAL FIRE, we had Chief Dan Talbot and Battalion Chief Rick Griggs, who brought forth the information we needed to look at our ambulance service where the cost uh, continues to escalate. As we work through the negotiations, it might have seemed like we were unhappy with the service we were getting from both police and fire, but uh, nothing could be further from the truth. We think that the two organizations we work with are probably some of the best in our in the state of California, and uh, they are constantly looking after our residents and providing the best service they can. We're in a long process right now of us making the public service representatives know that what our needs are and and how the city of Rancho Mirage is going to financially look over the next couple of years, and at the same time. We're looking for the residents to get the best in public safety available. So once again, I want to thank those who were involved in the process. It was a long process, as Dana said, but we believe we're ready to begin. And the evaluation of our current services, looking at where we go in the future and how we determine what we need to do in the future. So at this time, I'll let uh, Dana go ahead with the motion, and uh, it was a very interesting process. I think we all got a lot out of it. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Mr. Mayor, 
Uh, <clears throat> I would move that the City Council, Library Board, Housing Authority Board, and Community Services District Board approve and adopt the following resolutions identified uh, in our staff report as A through F, Abel through Frank, which approve the City, the Library, Housing Authority, and Community Service District budgets for fiscal year 2016-2017. I'll second the motion. Uh, please vote. And the motion passes five to zero. Richard has a motion. Mr. Mayor, I have one additional uh, motion I'd like to make to add to the budget process. And this is a motion that directs the city council staff to work with the budget subcommittee and to research options for public safety cost recovery methods that don't increase taxes for our residents. Second. Please vote. And the motion passes five to zero. Thank you. The uh, next order of business is the award of contract for website maintenance, hosting and security. Sean Smith, our Director of Economic Development and Marketing, will present that. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon. On March 31st, staff issued a request for proposals for website maintenance, hosting, security, and digital marketing services for the city's home, tourism, and economic development web pages. Twenty-three potential bidders downloaded the RFP with three submitting. Upon staff completion of its review and evaluation of each submitted proposal, all three were brought before the Tourism and Marketing Subcommittee consisting of Councilmember Smotrich and Councilmember Hobart. The three bids were evaluated based upon the RFP criteria of cost, ability to perform requirements, qualifications of personnel, past performance, and references. Talent Evolution was determined to be the clear choice. Talent Evolution has provided the previously mentioned services to the city for the last several years with great satisfaction. Not only have they helped to create, host, and manage the city's websites, as shown on this slide, they've also built Rancho Mirage's social media platform through the creation of Relax and Dine mobile apps and the Relax Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest pages. Perhaps not as sexy, but certainly more importantly, Talent Evolution has provided a very high level of website security. Talent Evolution's effort in this regard has prevented Rancho Mirage from being hacked, as has been reported in the news for quite a number of other agencies and organizations. And these victims, including police departments, have been forced to pay ransoms in order to have their content released. This is a significant threat as evidenced by the over 3,000 unauthorized attempts to access our city's website in the last 30 days alone. The total cost of the contract is $199,600 and is a shared cost between marketing and information services at $104,800 and $94,800 respectively. Due to the significant time, effort, and cost that has already been put into the city's websites and social media platform, the term of this contract is recommended for five years with the ability to terminate at any time with a 30-day notice. With that, staff recommends approval of a five-year contract for the services as spelled out in the staff report and RFP with Talent Evolution in the amount of $199,600. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Does the uh, council have any questions at all? I have one. Uh, in these contracts, they're all written for five years. <clears throat> and uh, just out of curiosity, what are the terms, both from the supplier standpoint and the city's standpoint, for terminating a contract? With this contract and the two that you'll be hearing, um, the proposed terms are five years for each. And the ability for us to terminate any one of those contracts is very clearly spelled out within those contracts with 30-day written notice for any reason whatsoever. Great, thank you. Uh, are there any other council comments? Are there any questions or comments from the public? Seeing none, I'll call for a motion regarding uh, the award to, uh, for website maintenance. Second. Second? Second. Please vote. Excuse me. Danny, well, just just for the question? record, I think we should state what that motion is. That it's the motion to approve the award of contract to Talent Evolution 
an authorized city manager to enter into a five-year contract for website maintenance, hosting, security, and digital marketing services in the amount of $199,600. And, and is there then again a second specifically on second. that language? Please vote. And the motion is approved five to zero. The next item will also be presented by Sean Smith, and that's the award of contract for City Magazine and Newsletter Publishing Services. Thank you again, Mayor. On March 31st, staff issued a request for proposals for the City Magazine, RM Magazine, and Newsletter Publication, RM Insider. Three potential bidders downloaded the RFP with only Desert Publications submitting a proposal. Upon staff completion of its review and evaluation of the proposal, as with the website RFP, Desert Publications proposal was brought before the Tourism and Marketing Subcommittee, consisting of Councilmember Smotrich and Councilmember Hobart. Desert Publications proposal is consistent with the requirements as presented in the RFP, which includes a production and distribution schedule, research, writing, photography, publishing, mailing, and distribution of both the RM Magazine and RM Insider. RM Magazine, as you can see the most recent editions cover on the slide above you, is the city's annual publication that is mailed to all Rancho Mirage residents and businesses, as well as delivered to all Rancho Mirage resorts. Rancho Mirage Insider is published three times a year and is mailed to all Rancho Mirage residents and businesses. Desert Publications has been a critical partner in developing our great newsletter and magazine for which the launch party has become an honored celebration. Based on Desert Publications' qualifications and past performance, staff recommends approval of a five-year contract for the services as spelled out in the staff report and RFP with Desert Publications in the amount of $180,000. The five-year term of the contract is proposed in order to ensure continued publication services in keeping with the Ranch Mirage brand, but can be terminated at any time with a 30-day notice. Additionally, staff will work with Desert Publications to lower the city's cost paid through editorials that work with each edition of the RM Magazine. And with that, staff recommends approval of a five-year contract for services as spelled out in the staff report and RFP with Desert Publications in the amount of $180,000. Thank you. Does uh, council have any comments? Yes, Richard? Uh, Sean, do we have any provision in there for cost increases over that five-year period of time? We do not. That price is locked in. Okay. With us yeah. having the same exit issues that we had with respect to the IT matter. That's correct. <clears throat> any other council questions? We'll open it to the public. Does the public have any questions at all? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, I'll close that. I'll make a motion that the City Council approve no. the award of contract to Desert Publications, Inc., and authorize the City Manager to enter into a five-year contract for City Magazine and Newsletter Publishing in the amount of $180,000. There's a second. Please vote. And the motion is approved five to zero. Yes, uh, we'll take a five-minute uh, recess. Thank you.
All right, the, uh, we'll wait for our councilman, Mr. Kite, to, uh, to arrive. And I think we are now ready to go. The uh, next item on the agenda is item number 10, and it's the award of contract for design and advertising services. And Sean Smith, our Director of Economic Development and Marketing, will handle this. Sean? Thank you again, Mayor. So this is a third um, critical component of our tourism and marketing effort. And it is the result of a request for proposals for design and advertising services. And on March 31st, staff issued an RFP for a design and advertising agency with significant understanding of brand and destination management. Fifteen potential bidders downloaded the RFP with two vendors submitting a proposal. Upon staff's completion of its review and evaluation of each submitted proposal, both were brought before the Tourism and Marketing Subcommittee. Based upon the RFP criteria of cost, ability to perform requirements, qualifications of personnel, past performance, and references, it was determined that Buzz Factory should remain the city's design and advertising firm. Approval of this contract will ensure that the city continues to receive the high quality work representative of the Rancho Marge brand that Buzz provides. The images on the slide show the quality of product for a wide variety of activities recently produced for the city. As with the other marketing related contracts, the term of this contract is being proposed for five years with the ability to terminate with a 30 day notice. And with that, staff recommends approval of a five year contract for services as spelled out in the staff report and RFP with Buzz Factory in the amount of $40,000. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Uh, are there any council comments? No. No. I'll ask the public, does the public have any comments? Seeing none, I'll close that and I'll ask for a motion on, uh, on this item. Okay, I will move that the City Council approve the award of contract to Buzz Factory and authorize the City Manager to enter into a five-year contract in the amount of $40,000. Is there a second? Okay. Please vote. And the motion passes five to zero. The next item, number 11, is the Ago Caliente Tribe has approved the, <coughs> excuse me, the specific plan for section 24. Item 11 is the next step in the process. And with that, I will ask uh, our city manager uh, to uh, uh, initiate the beginning of this uh, discussion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Item number 11 on your agenda, as the Mayor mentioned, is Section 24 in the Tribal Approved Specific Plan, Environmental Impact Statement, and Tentative Track Map. Uh, a couple of uh, meetings ago, staff uh, met with the um, Sphere of Influence Subcommittee, Councilwoman Iris Motridge and Councilman Dana Hobart, and we talked about a conceptual entitlement agreement, and the Council looked at that uh, a couple of meetings ago and recommended um, approval a continuance right Steve that was a yes. continuance that was a continuance the uh, section 24 area is in our sphere of influence it's a large part of our sphere of influence and it's bounded by Ramon Road on the north Dinah Shore on the south Bob Hope on the east and Los Alamos Road on the west it's a square mile about 640 acres and the city actually surrounds it uh, with incorporated land on all four sides this is uh, section 24 is part of the uh, 35,000 acre Agua Caliente Band of Cuya Indians formal reservation boundary and Bob Hope Drive I think is the eastern boundary of that um, of the 35,000 acre reservation. The tribe followed a uh, similar process for section 24 like they did with the Agua Caliente Resort Casino when it was approved across the street. We know that the tribe is a sovereign nation and they have a set of land use guidelines, Tribal Environmental Policy Act, and they also have a Tribal Habitat Conservation Plan. Last year, uh, like they did with the uh, casino, last year the tribe, Tribal Council certified the Comprehensive Environmental Impact Study for Section 24 and approved the Comprehensive Specific Plan and a tentative track map. Parallel process that the city uh, would have um, followed. Now, uh, prior to uh, development, it's time for the city to accept all the approvals granted by the Tribal Council and allow the land to be annexed to the city uh, and implement the tribally issued entitlements. 
I would prefer, and I think the city would prefer, that we have one comprehensive annexation for the entire square mile. Um, but at this time, the Tribal Council is not interested in annexing the Tribal Trust land into the city, and the city respects that uh, um, decision. We have, um, we have cooperated in good faith for many years with the Tribal members and their administrative employees. It's a constructive relationship, and it's built on mutual respect. And I'm sure when the Tribe is uh, ready to consider development on Tribal Trust land, we can have discussion, uh, annexation discussions again at that time. But Mr. Mayor, in the meanwhile, Pulte Group is ready to move forward on their project with their master plan community. The project is consistent with the medium density designation, the pre-zoning designation that's on the property uh, that has been in place in our general plan since the general plan was adopted in 2005. Um, so what we have on your agenda today are three items. There's two resolutions and one uh, entitlement processing agreement. And uh, I would like to turn the presentation over, Mr. Mayor, to our hardworking city attorney, Steve Quintanilla, for a summary discussion on the three actions requested today. Oh, thank you, Randy. I don't know if it's my new medication got me sick or the 500 pages of comments <laughs> <laughs> that we received in this project. Um, you're going to see this project come back a few times, and it's going to come back because there are various steps we have to take um, in order to complete the annexation and actually approve the project. So the first step in this process is going to be we have to do some sort of CEQA analysis. And fortunately, um, the CEQA guidelines provide that if we have an environmental impact statement that was prepared and we haven't prepared an EIR, and that environmental impact statement which was prepared under a different set of rules, federal rules, that apply particularly to the tribe, if that environmental impact statement has considered mitigation measures and growth-inducing impacts, then we can adopt that EIS, that environmental impact statement, and use it for our EIR. So we don't have to go through the expense, the time, and all the effort to do another EIR. So we reviewed, the staff reviewed the environmental impact statement and, and has, we put together a resolution that sets forth all the, the necessary findings that the council needs to make um, with respect to CEQA. And I just point out too that the resolution also indicates that, um, you know, based on staff's review, we believe that the tribe process that environmental impact statement consistent with the CEQA guidelines that apply to the city as a lead agency. <laughs> So that is going to be the first step, is to adopt this resolution. I'm going to uh, recommend that you adopt all three of these actions at the very end. The one thing I do want to add to the environmental impact statement um, is this, well, first of all, before I, we add that, I wasn't kidding. We have about 500 pages here that each of you have received, and I just want to identify what these are. Um, the first one that we received was dated June 6, and this is the one that has about 300 pages attached, 280-some. And this basically is a cover page that was addressed to the city, a cover letter addressed to the city that includes as an attachment a letter that includes all the comments that were submitted to the tribe with respect to the draft environmental impact statement. So essentially, they just pass these on to us. And, uh, and staff and... Staff has concluded that all of these comments have been properly responded to by the tribe when they were considering the draft, EI, the draft EIS. We also received a letter dated June 14, 2016, and this letter raises, it's, and these, both these letters are from um, the firm of Luzel, Luzil, Luzil Drury. And they represent the um, Laborers International Union of North America, Local Union 1184. So it's a labor union. Well, they submitted a letter dated June 14th, and in this letter they raise additional, they present additional comments with respect to the environmental impact statement and our plan to um, use that, EI, that environmental impact statement as our, as our environmental impact report. Well. On June, you have a letter in here dated June 16, and this letter is um, from a firm known as Meridian Consultants, and Meridian Consultants is the firm that prepared the environmental impact statement that was certified by the tribe. And in this letter, they address all of the comments 
that were raised in the letter dated June 14th. So I had an opportunity to quickly review through this, and I'm satisfied that this particular letter properly and adequately addresses the comments that were submitted in June 14, 2016. So these are going to be part of the administrative record, and that's why we had to distribute them and let you see them. So I, I'm recommending that if you adopt this um, resolution, sequel resolution, that we add this additional finding to the resolution based on this information we just received. <clears throat> and that would, I'll just read it into the record. So we would include a finding at the end of section three, and we would, it would be uh, paragraph H, and it should read, the city received and considered the letters and attachments submitted by Luzul Drury LLP dated June 6, 2016, which includes as attachments the letters previously, previously sent to the tribe on January 16, January 20, and March 23, 2015, and the letter dated June 14, 2016. The city also received and considered the responses to those comments included in the final EIS and the additional responses and evidence submitted to the tribe and to the city by Meridian Consultants who prepared the EIS. Based upon its review of these materials and all the evidence in the record, the City Council finds that the arguments, expert opinions, and other information contained in the submissions by Luzel Drury, LLP, conflict with the study's expert opinions and factual conclusions set forth in the draft EIS, final EIS, and supplemental information provided by Meridian Consultants. City Council further finds that the expert opinion, studies, and conclusions in the draft EIS, final EIS, as updated and clarified by the additional information from Meridian Consultants, this thing, are more thorough, credible, persuasive, persuasive, and based on facts included in the record, and thus form the basis of the City Council's finding under CEQA with respect to the project's impacts as identified in the EIS, and which includes, without limitation, impacts pertaining to air quality and greenhouse gas emissions. I think it's important that we include this finding in here um, to demonstrate that we did actually consider the comments that were submitted June 14th, and we considered them by having Meridian Consultants respond to them. So it's very important we include that. <clears throat> so that's the, that's the CEQA resolution. So, and the next step is going to be to um, we're presenting an annexation resolution. So as the city manager discussed, this whole idea is to annex um, 320 acres of land from, the section, from section 24, annex that into the city. And that 320 acres is going to include, they, what, what was approved for that was a specific plan and a tentative track map. And the purpose of that, that project is going to consist of a um, active adult project. That's what it's going to be. It's a residential project. And so this annexation agreement is the first step in the annexation process. And this annexation is going to direct the staff to file an annexation application on behalf of the city. So the city is going to be the applicant in this annexation application. But the developers will have to fully cooperate with us. If they don't provide us with the information we need, we don't file the application. And I also want to point out that in the resolution, we, we, we make, make it, um, we point out that should we decide that this is going to create, uh, you know, uh, um, undue burden on the city from a financial perspective, and that's the process that staff is going through right now to determine what sort of fiscal impacts this project will have on the city services, that we can terminate these annexation proceedings at any time. But at this point, the resolution just simply directs staff to get the application together, work with the developer, and getting all the information we need, and filing it with LAFCO. And finally, we have a, an agreement in here, and the agreement is an entitled processing agreement. Um, I think a couple years ago, there was, a, there was an agreement between the city and the developers to process certain entitlements upon annexation of the project, of the area. And so in this entitlement process agreement, we kind of set forth the process we're going to follow with respect to getting this project approved by the city. And so the first thing that we're going to do in this agreement is that 
the City Council will adopt a resolution authorizing the annexation and submitting the application. The next thing we will do, and we'll bring this back to the Council, we're in the process of, um, we're going to commence negotiations over this annexation and development agreement, and that's going to involve input from the subcommittee. And this annexation and development agreement is basically kind of a pre-zoning agreement. And it will, it will identify you know, certain issues of concern for both parties. It will provide the developer with vested rights to develop the project pursuant to all the regulations in place now. And we will probably get something in exchange from the developer that we can't otherwise get through the normal entitlement process. So it's a development agreement similar to what we, the last development agreement we did with the Ritz-Carlton. The third, the third thing we have to do is we have to approve the Section 24 specific plan that was adopted by the tribe and approve the tribe appro approve the tentative track map that was adopted by the tribe. And so I'm proposing that we take that to the City Council as soon as we can, along with the annexation and development agreement, and then we send the agreement, the specific plan, and the tentative track map to the Planning Commission for their, just as a receive and file item. And the reason why I think we should send those three together is to send the message to the Planning Commission that the Council is, is fine with the project as approved by the tribe, and that um, you know, this and we'll set forth the process that the City Council wants to follow in regards to approving this project. So it will go to the City, it will go to the Planning Commission just as a receive and file. And it will also define the scope of the Planning Commission's review of the preliminary development plan. So we are also are going to need a preliminary, preliminary development plan just like we do, uh, we require of all residential projects. And with the uh, PDP, there is going to be some discretion. The Planning Commission, the City Council will have some discretion to kind of tweak the project with respect to issues like landscaping, um, maybe architecture, and sign, a sign program? Yeah. yeah and design guidelines. And, and design guidelines. So because in the tentative track map and the specific plan that was adopted by the tribe, they don't zero in on those. So, so there's going to be some discretion that the, both the Planning Commission and Council will have in regards to the PDP. And that PDP ends up coming to the City Council for final approval. Um, in addition, we're, uh, we would, the City's agreeing to uh, process all the what we call ministerial permits. These are the permits that are approved over the counter. And those include like grading, the grading permits, building permits, things like that. And so the whole idea behind this agreement is to, is to have in writing, memorialize in writing that we are going to use our best efforts to fast track this project. And, and I think that if we can reasonably fast track this and get this project approved a lot faster than we do other projects because we, are, we have a specific plan and a tentative track map that's already been approved. NAIS. And, and an environmental impact statement. So my recommendation, after we get public input, is that the um, City Council adopt the, the, the um, sequel resolution, it's spelled out in the staff report, adopt the annexation resolution, and approve the entitlement processing agreement. Obviously, that's very, very involved. I'll ask for a council comments, please. Richard? Mr. Mayor. Uh just have a couple of questions. Uh, Steve, you're the expert on this whole process, but the planning expert on, amongst us is the city manager. And Randy, in the very beginning of your presentation, you brought up the issue about the city annexing the full parcel and that the uh, tribe did not want to do that. Uh, they didn't feel it was to their advantage to do that at this point. Can you go into a little bit more detail as to uh, why it would not be in our best interest to annex the full parcel? We can't. We can't. That's the short answer, is that uh, the Local Agency Formation Commission will not force annexation of Indian trust land against the wishes of the Indians. I see. So okay. I was not aware of that. And then the other thing is there is no proposed commercial project on that land yet, and when, when and if there is, that would be the time to have a discussion. 
But it's up to them to come to us and make that request rather than the other way around. No, I think we can make the request. I think it probably would be mutual. It might start with the joint tribal council, city council meeting to discuss some high level uh, um, issues in terms of what, what our uh, shared goals and visions are. And then we can get into the details of um, sharing services and um, expenditures and revenues. It just seems a little odd when you look at the map and the strip of land all the way around the 320 acres, how it's cut out like that. I'm going to suggest um, if, if council will hold their comments for a few moments, we do have uh, a request. I'll open up the public comments and we'll come back to council. Uh, Rebecca Davis, uh, would you like to? Uh, we have the developers here too. Yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, honorable members of the city council, city attorney. My name is Rebecca Davis and I represent Laborers International Union of North America, Local 1184, the members that live in and around the county of Riverside. And as you do have before you, we have submitted previous comments, um, both those that were submitted during the TIPA process, as well as a set of new comments um, looking specifically at the environmental impacts of the active adult project. Our comments include expert comments of expert wildlife biologists, civil and traffic engineer Daniel Smith, and hazards and air quality consultant Matthew Hageman and Jesse Yeager. Based on these comments, there is substantial evidence to support a fair argument that this project will have significant and unmitigated environmental impacts. The city is required to prepare an EIR to fully analyze and mitigate these significant impacts. I want to highlight just a few key points from these letters that we've submitted. First, I want to explain that the EIS prepared by the tribe under TIPA does not satisfy the procedural requirements of CEQA. Now, the tribe admitted that it lacks jurisdiction to serve as the lead agency under CEQA. And as a result, it could not have prepared a CEQA document. During the TIPA process, the tribe suggested that the project may be subject to CEQA at some later unspecified time, and that at that point, the city or, LAF or LAFCO may certify the EIS as a CEQA document. However, as we said, during the TIPA process, because the EIS was prepared without the involvement of a lead agency under CEQA and without regards to CEQA's procedural requirement, it is improper for a CEQA document, a CEQA lead agency to now certify the EIS after the TIPA process has been completed. CEQA requires that a lead agency be involved actively throughout the CEQA process, since the document must represent the independent judgment of the lead agency. Lead agencies have a host of mandatory duties under CEQA, including determining whether an EIR is required, consulting with responsible and trustee agencies, and um, among, another, among other responsibilities. The city played no role in any of this during the TIPA process. For there to be a valid CEQA environmental review document, there must have been CEQA lead agencies actively involved in the CEQA review analysis from the beginning. This has not happened here, and as a result, the FEIS is simply ineffective as a CEQA document. Now, the city is trying to rely on Section 15221 of CEQA in order to adopt the EIS, but this reliance is misplaced. Section 15221 of CEQA provides that when a project will require compliance with both CEQA and NEPA, the city may use the EIS for from the NEPA review rather than preparing an EIR under CEQA. But section 15221 makes no mention of TIPA, and neither section 15221 nor any other section of CEQA allow the city to use a TIPA document to comply with CEQA, which is precisely what the city is proposing to do. As a result, section 15221 is completely irrelevant, and the FEIS may not be adopted as a proper CEQA document. Second, I'd just like to quickly talk about the EIS's violation of CEQA because there is substantial evidence in the record that the project will have a significant and unmitigated environmental impacts, even just looking at the active adult project alone. 
There will be significant greenhouse gas impacts, which the EIS does not indicate as significant, but as our comments on this indicate, the analysis used in the EIS has actually recently been um, found to be invalid by the Supreme Court of California. Our experts ran an analysis that does not run afoul of the court's decision and found that this project will have significant greenhouse gas impacts that must be mitigated. Finally, CEQA has a substantive mandate that precludes a lead agency from approving a project without requiring all feasible mitigation measures. This substantive mandate has not been met here. As we've detailed in numerous comment letters, there are dozens, if not more, additional feasible mitigation measures that can be implemented to reduce the project's air quality, greenhouse gas emissions, biological impacts, traffic impacts, just to name a few. Even simple things such as requiring installation of programmable thermostat timers can reduce the impacts of this project. Yet none of these additional measures have been considered or incorporated into the project. Instead, the proposed mitigation measures that are adopted in the EIS violate CEQA because they are optional. For example, solar panels are to be considered but not required. Lead certification is encouraged but not required. Cool roofs are encouraged but not required. Low VOC flooring and insulation is encouraged but not required. None of these measures constitute mitigation under CEQA. Mitigation measures cannot be remote or speculative. They must be effective and enforceable. These me measures constitute impermissible deferral of mitigation under CEQA and do not commit the agency to any specific performance standard that can be enforced. So to conclude, Leona urges the city to deny the resolution and to prepare an EIR for the proposed project to analyze the project's significant environmental impacts under CEQA and to require all feasible mitigation measures to to reduce those impacts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd just like to respond just briefly to some of the issues she's raised. And we have the consultant here from Meridian Consultants who prepared the EIS. And so maybe you can fill in as well on issues I don't cover. Um, she's referring to the Environmental Protection Act portion that applies to tribal land. And basically, TIPA and NEPA are substantially similar. And we, and the city has, was involved with the, the uh, process in, with respect to dr the drafting and all the research um, regarding the environmental impact statement. So the city was there from the beginning monitoring the environmental analysis of the project. And CEQA does, says under the CEQA guidelines, under 15221 and 15225, specifically allows the city to use an EIS, whether it's a tribal EIS or a regular EIS, um, if we make a determination that the mitigation, mitigation measures were approved and we included a copy of the mitigation monitoring program from the, from the environmental impact statement to demonstrate that mitigation measures were, were actually approved. And it's clear that the document in the EIS also addresses the growth inducing impacts. There's actually a section in there that deals specifically for, with growth inducing impacts. So I believe the, we meet the standard under the CEQA guidelines to use this EIS at, in lieu of preparing an EIR. This EIS process was pretty extensive. It was just as extensive as our EIR process. In, mon in tracking everything that the tribe did with respect to processing that EIS, they did exactly and probably even more than what would be required under CEQA. So we think that the, I believe that there's a, you know they've been very the tribe was very thorough in its analysis. They had qualified experts on board to prepare this, EI, this EIS, and so we and we have specific findings in here that indicate that that this EIS was processed consistent with the CEQA guidelines and CEQA itself. 
Um, is it Chris? Oh, Jim, do you want to introduce anybody on your end to respond to some of these comments? Yes, thank you, Steve. Uh, my name is Jim Vaughn, and I'm the CEQA and Land Use Attorney for Pulte Homes. And I would just like to briefly respond to the procedural issues that were raised with respect to complying with CEQA. And then I'll hand it over to Tony Licacciato, who is the uh, lead for Meridian Consultants, who prepared the EIR and prepared those lengthy responses that you saw there on the dais. With respect to procedure, I just want to make sure that, that everybody understands this has been a lengthy, lengthy, substantive environmental review process, no matter what name you put on it. It started at least three years ago. And so the EIS that the tribe oversaw preparation of and ultimately approved is exactly the same as an EIR. And where I think the, uh, the previous speaker has, has kind of missed the point is that it doesn't really matter under this guideline whether you're talking about an EIS prepared under NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Act, or an EIS, an environmental impact statement, prepared under TEPA, the Tribal Environmental Policy Act, they serve the same purpose which is they require thorough environmental review before proceeding with the project. And the key though, the key is not whether it's NEPA or TEPA that the initial document was processed under. What matters is, does it comply with CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, which is what governs your actions, or doesn't it? So that's the question. The question is, did this document that was already prepared, does it comply with the substantive and the procedural requirements of CEQA? And there were several misstatements made during that prior presentation about the fact that the procedural requirements were not followed. That's just not true. As a matter of fact, every single step along the way that is required of an EIR, whether it's a notice of preparation, a uh, hearing on the notice of preparation to obtain comments from the public, whether it's a 45-day public review period for the draft environmental impact statement, all of those things happened. There were responses to all of those comments. All of the steps that occur uh, under CEQA occurred here, even though it wasn't required under TEPA. And that's really the point. So now you are, are asked, do you want to redo that entire three-year environmental review process over again, or does CEQA require that? And that's the point of guidelines 15521 through 155, uh, 15221, I'm sorry, and through 15225 is that they say, no, you don't have to redo that entire process. That's not what CEQA is about. It's not intended to require endless rounds of uh, environmental review and re-review and circulation and recirculation. It's intended to make sure that the environmental effects of a project are, uh, are identified, are analyzed, are mitigated to the extent feasible, and if they're not fully mitigated, to a level of less than significant, are there overriding considerations that make those impacts acceptable to the, to the public agency? That's the question. And so here, all those requirements were followed. Um, I think the only other statement, I think Steve may have already corrected this, but the notion that the city was not involved in this process is completely false. In fact, the city had its own internal, thorough, multi-month review of the draft environmental impact statement before it was released to the public, just as it would have if it was the lead agency under CEQA at that time. So in fact, uh, the city is now the lead agency acting under CEQA, but even before it was the lead agency, it acted as one so far as it was involved in the process and worked with the tribe and had its input and made sure from a staff level that the city was satisfied as to the substance of what was being studied and the conclusions and the determinations. So the city was involved. So based on that, uh, the city attorney and I both agree that the uh, substantive requirements of CEQA and the procedural requirements have been met here and that it is appropriate for the city to certify this uh, mm -hmm. environmental document at this time as the city's EIR. And if there are questions on the procedure, I'm happy to answer them. The only last thing I'd clarify is in the comments and in the responses to comments, I think there's been some misstatements made about the city's role. And again, just to be clear, the tribe was not acting as a lead agency under CEQA. It was acting under TEPA as the decision-making body, uh, as it's supposed to do. 
The city is now the lead agency. It's the first agency to act under the California Environmental Quality Act, and that's why it's making these determinations. So if there are questions about the procedure, I'm happy to answer them. I think uh, Mr. Lacacciato would like to speak as to the substantive points that were raised. I will tell you that they were all thoroughly addressed in, those, uh, in the final EIS and in the comments, and in the responses to comments, I mean. And the last thing I would say is, to the extent that what you have here is conflicting expert opinions, you have, I don't know, a half pound of expert opinions uh, submitted by the last speaker. There's about a half pound of, of responses and expert opinions and analysis uh, weighing against that on top of the final environmental impact statement. When you have competing expert opinions, it's for the city to decide who they find more credible. And that was, I think, what the city attorney was bringing up and what he added to the, the CEQA resolution was to clarify that in, in the city attorney's view and in the city's view, if you, if you follow his uh, guidance, uh, the EIS and the supplemental responses from Meridian Consultants are, in fact, based on true facts in the record and are more credible. So with that, I'll hand it over to Mr. Lacacciato. Just one, one second. Randy, could you kind of add to this discussion uh, from the city's perspective of what's going on so that people get another understanding of it? Certainly. So, you know, the city, as Jim had mentioned, the city was involved in the Tribal Environmental Policy Act process. We provided comments to the tribe on the draft documents. We received um, comments back on it. We uh, attended workshops that the tribe put forth on the um, specific plan and the environmental impact statement and in my mind I think it's clear that CEQA is not in in place to require duplicative environmental analyses of exactly basically the same project in this case the tribe spent a lot of time and effort and money uh, putting together the um, environmental impact report and approving and preparing the specific plan and really I think what you're having being asked here from the other speaker Ms. Davis is to throw that away and start over with a new document well I have a feeling even if we wrote, wrote a brand new duplicative environmental impact report uh, that Ms. Davis would be back a, a, here a year from now suggesting there are deficiencies in the EIR. And we know that when CEQA was adopted in 1972 and has been amended many times since then, the intention is not to duplicate environmental analysis. It's to analyze projects, create mitigation measures, and minimize uh, environmental impacts of projects to the extent feasible. And that's what we've done in the mitigation measure and monitoring program that's attached to your resolution today. On that subject, can I ask a question of you and Steve? <clears throat> Was there anything that the city could have done over the last two years that would have prevented the project from getting to the point where it is now, where it's had a SEPA uh, authorization, it's passed the SEPA test. Um, the property, as I recall, is a Lati property at the, at the present time, and as a result of it being Indian Lati property, it is under the authority of the tribe, not under the authority of the city, uh, for us to um, impose regulations on it uh, on, in any of these categories, any of the uh, environmental issue categories. And that even if the city did not get involved, the project would still be going forward with, uh, without city approval, and a number of changes that have been made at the instigation of the city to the developers uh, have been initiated so that the city can get a better project than, from its perspective than uh, would have been on that property if the uh, city and the developers did not get together and try to work uh, some additional points out that we felt were important. Those points were not important to the developers, they were important to Rancho Mirage. And for us to get that, we had to uh, agree, we had no choice but to agree that the SEPA, that is the Tribe Environmental Impact Study, uh, was accepted uh, and that it's essentially the same, if not there may be some minor differences, but essentially the same as the CEQA uh, requirements. And that uh, by approving this now, 
if we disapprove this now, it'd go right back to the tribe, right. where the tribe would approve it without the changes that we have negotiated uh, for the betterment of our community. We can't negotiate completely because the developers know that uh, they could say no to us and go back to the tribe and get what they want. So we try to find happy meeting grounds as compared to happy hunting grounds, so to speak, uh, where we come to agreement uh, that improves what would be there if we didn't agree. And if we went along with the lady, young lady's perspective about uh, how we uh, should do better toward compliance with CEQA. That's exactly right, Councilman. There's two people I see here today that were instrumental in exactly that um, thought process when the tribe approved and built the uh, Agua Caliente Resort Casino. That's yourself and Tom Davis, who's the equivalent of the city manager of the Agua Caliente Indians. I, I also want to just point out the obvious, and the obvious is that the tribe is a sovereign nation. And so the city has absolutely no authority to influence that project one way or the other. They're a sovereign nation. And I think it's to the benefit of the city to bring that land within the city of Rancho Mirage because we have an agreement with the tribe in which the tribe agrees that Alati land is subject to our land use regulations. There are exceptions. Right. And so that would come in well, I understand that actually developers are going to take fee title to the land well, eventually. Yeah, whether okay. it's fee or lati, I think yeah. it's still subject to the yeah. land use agreement once it's annexed. Yeah. Yeah. It's subject to the land use agreement, subject to an appeal by anybody, but it would, the appeal would go to the tribal side for, re, for decision of the uh, uh, whatever the appeal, appealed issue was. Yeah, right. We would not control it. Right. The tribal approach would control it. And the land use agreement specifically says that the tribal council is a final decision making body. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, could I just be Please. heard? I just want to clarify if I could with respect to Councilmember Hobart's comments. I think they're they're spot on, but I just want to make sure because a lot of acronyms are getting thrown around um, today between the different presentations you've heard. And I just want to make sure um, that from a compliance with CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act uh, today, you do have discretion under that act to decide for yourselves as a city council, was this environmental impact statement adequate and proper under CEQA to uh, fully address the envi potential environmental impacts of this project? Were, they, were those impacts uh, mitigated to the maximum extent feasible? Uh, or not, and those are the things Randy had mentioned. That's the discretion you do have, uh, but Mr. Hobart is, is absolutely correct. Theoretically, if you decided that you did not agree with the secret document, or more importantly, if you decided that you didn't like the project at all and just don't want to have the project, regardless of how terrific the environmental review has been over the last three years, you still might not like the project. If you don't like the project, and it, and it still is uh, an approved project by the tribe, and uh, as, as long as it is still owned by the Alatis or any, uh, any member of the tribe uh, or the tribe itself, it can be built. And, and you, you, you as a city council would not have any input in that uh, whatsoever, including how to uh, mitigate impacts that may occur. Yeah, I think we're sensitive to that. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I'm Tony Lucacciato, partner of Meridian Consultants, and I managed the preparation of the environmental impact statement for the tribe and worked with your city staff on it. Um, I've been preparing environmental review documents, primarily EIRs for cities, for 35 years now. Um, in sitting down with the planning staff at Agua Caliente to begin this project, they sat down, one of the key concepts in CEQA is consultation, active consultation. Active consultation was held with City of Rancho Mirage staff. The Agua Caliente Tribal Planning Department said, we want to follow the CEQA process here. And I just wanted to point out a few more things the previous speakers have said. The process that we follow when preparing an ER for a city like City of Rancho Mirage was followed exactly for the CIS. Examples. Um, some of them Jim Vaughn mentioned, but when the draft EIS was completed and ready for review, it was also sent to the state clearinghouse, which is the office 
part of the Governor's Office of Planning and Research that distributes draft environmental impact reports to state agencies for their review and comment. We followed that process, all the noticing requirements. So each and every step, so the process for preparing an EIR was followed exactly to prepare the CIS. And in addition, all the substantive requirements, which are the content requirements were there. Uh, Mr. Quintanella mentioned the growth inducing impacts and some of the other analyses required by the CEQA guidelines that aren't required under the tribe's TIPA or even under NEPA. So in terms of organization, content, and process, 100% consistent with the CEQA process. In regard to a couple of the comments that were made on the analysis, um, first, air quality impacts and mitigation measures. I will say the additional material we submitted today was held up and it was big, but uh, most of that was an updated air quality model run we did yesterday to respond to some I'll be honest, a little bit nitpicky technical comments about some of the assumptions used. Because we've already responded to these comments in detail in the EIS, we were actually able to respond to the additional comments in about half a dozen pages. There just wasn't that much new or significant raised. So again, we had about half a dozen pages of responses and an updated air quality model run to tweak a couple of the assumptions as suggested. When we reran it, the impacts are not substantially more severe. Um, when it comes to the mitigation measures that are in the EIS, I just pulled a few, for example, out of the air quality section. The word shall is used in all of them. That implies it must be done, there's enforceability, and there's a mitigation monitoring and reporting program adopted to show how that has to happen. Um, for each topic in the EIS, there are features of the project identified as project design features. These are the characteristics of the project that already mitigate environmental impacts. So then we analyzed with those features, then we also identified additional mitigation measures. Some of the ones in the air quality section for, to mitigate construction impactors, uh, impacts. The contractor shall incorporate the following into construction plans and specifications. Coatings and solvents with a VOC content lower than required under rule 1113 which is set forth by the South Coast Air Quality Management District, shall be used. Um, construction equipment engines shall, shall utilize Tier 4 engines or better. These are the highest emission control engines you can get on heavy-duty construction equipment. So those are the, some of the project design features. Um, builders, when they get down to building the home, builders shall use flooring and insulation products products that are low emitting in terms of volatile organic compounds, VOC. So again, every project design feature and every mitigation measure has the word shall in it, and it does require implementation. Now, greenhouse gases, um, real briefly, um, the one bit of news was brought up in the additional letter was there was a Supreme Court decision um, on a master plan community in Los Angeles County, New Hall Ranch, uh, which addressed the method used in this document. Um, my firm's actually preparing the additional analysis in response to that Supreme Court decision for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and for the County of Los Angeles, so I'm very familiar with the case. Various methods have been used to analyze greenhouse gas emissions and effects to mitigate, and this all comes from really the planning side rather than the environmental side. Our state has adopted Assembly Bill AB 32, which sets forth statewide goals for reducing greenhouse gases. To implement that, the California Air Resources Board has prepared a scoping plan, which identifies the percentages of reductions for different sectors and activities in the state to meet our overall statewide goal. Land use development is one of those sectors. There's transportation, a variety of others. Um, but the real core of the planning effort is for mitigation reduction of greenhouse gases to be figured out and done at the local level since every community is different. Your city's already done that. You've adopted your sustainability plan in 2013. It identifies the greenhouse gas reduction goals you have for the city of Rancho Mirage and the strategies and actions that will be taken to achieve that by the year 2020. In the EIS, we looked at greenhouse gases in a variety of ways because of all the jurisdictions involved. It was being prepared by the Agua Caliente. The land is currently in un unincorporated Riverside County, and there was a possibility at that time, and now you're looking at taking action on annexing um, this site to the city of Ranch Mirage. So we 
We looked at the consistency from the tribe standpoint. We analyzed the consistency of the greenhouse gas emissions and the strategies to reduce those emissions, the mitigation measure project features, in accordance with the county of Riverside's adopted climate action plan. They have a 100-point rating scale. We looked at the features of the project, documented all that, comes up at 103 points, so it's consistent with the county's plan. We also looked at the consistency of the project and the features that would reduce and mitigate greenhouse gas emissions with the city's 2013 sustainability plan. Also determined consistency with that. Then we also looked at another method, which was the one that was in question in the Supreme Court case, which is just the overall reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from the features of the project. So I want to point out the Supreme Court didn't find that method invalid. What it said was, hmm, we don't quite see the link between a statewide goal and individual development project. Do some more work and show that's the right number. So that work's being done, but didn't invalidate that method. As it is, that approach we used was only one. The real method used, which is the one that the South Coast Air Quality Management District has as their second approach, best approach is analyzing the consistency with adopted plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to meet our statewide AB 32 goals. So again, the EIS assesses consistency with your plan and the county's plan. It was found to be consistent with both. So the analysis in there is not inconsistent with the Supreme Court's recent decision. Be happy to answer any other specific questions you have. Thank you. Are there any questions? Any further questions? Would anybody else care to speak? Yes, Ms. Davis, would you like to come up? One or two points, real quick. Um, so, previous speakers have been mentioning that the process was consistent with CEQA. But without a lead agency, there is no way for the process to have been consistent with CEQA. There are a number of requirements in CEQA that refer to actions by the lead agency. With no lead agency, those were not followed. I'd also just like to quickly say the, the sections of CEQA that have been cited by the city to support reliance on an EIS, um, EIS is the acronym for both environmental documents under NEPA and TIPA. But all of those sections being referred to are, fall under Article 14 of CEQA, um, which is entitled Projects Also Subject to the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. There is no mention of TIPA anywhere in, in CEQA. I understand that there may be some e uneasiness with throwing out this entire document, and we're not necessarily saying throw out the entire document. In fact, we've been saying for the past three years that CEQA needs to be done for this project. This isn't the first time we've brought this up. This could have been done alongside the analysis together and at this point have been completed. But that was rejected by both um, the tribe and the city at the time when we tried to raise this. Um, from a substantive perspective, the issue now is whether the city is approving a project where there is evidence of additional feasible mitigation measures to reduce the project's impacts. And here there is clearly additional feasible mitigation measures that can be implemented. And there is no evidence in the record to show that these additional measures are not feasible. And without that, the CEQA document will not be able to be upheld. With regards to the, my final point will be that, um, oh, two points, sorry. Using the word shall in a mitigation measure does nothing when the word shall is followed by the word consider or encourage. So regardless of, use, of what you say and, and use the word shall, the point is, is it a measure that is an enforceable and certain to occur? My final point is on the GHG, the greenhouse gas um, analysis. The analysis in the EIS relies on method three, or I, I apologize, method four of the South Coast Air Quality Management District, which is the one that has been um, analyzed in the recent Supreme Court decision. It's true it wasn't said to be entirely, um, it wasn't entirely overturned, but, it, but what the opinion says is that there has to be some substantial evidence showing a direct link of why is the number applicable to the state also applicable directly to a development, an individual development. And in this case, there is no substantial evidence to show that the number from the state should be directly tied to an individual development. And 
The claim that the EIS is relying on the Rancho Mirage greenhouse gas plan is just inconsistent with the document. The, the EIS prepared by the tribe would not have found that the, um, that the, the threshold is met by meeting a standard for the city of Rancho Mirage. Um, and what it did was it relied on method number four, as we've described. Um, and I'll just leave it at that, unless there's any questions. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody from the Pulte group that would like to make any final comments? Thank you again, Jim Vaughn, uh, Council for Pulte Homes. I, I think we're at the verge of beating these last few points to death, but I do think it is important that uh, the record be clear on at least uh, our position on what the law is on these things. So with respect to the idea that in order to comply with these guidelines, there has to be a lead agency involved under CEQA, that's just not true. There's nothing in those guideline sections, and the city attorney uh, and I have reviewed them and discussed them thoroughly. There is nothing in those guidelines that in any way say that they do not apply to an environmental impact statement uh, approved under TIPA versus NEPA. That, that's an implication being made by Ms. Davis that for some reason the tribe and all the work that it put in over the last three years just doesn't rise to the level of what NEPA requires. And there's no evidence that supports that. In fact, the document itself and how thorough it is uh, says just the opposite. Uh, secondly, uh, Ms. Davis is confusing what the current standard is, and, and she made this reference earlier in her comments that uh, if there's any substantial evidence in the record that there may be an impact that isn't mitigated, you have to do an EIR. That would be the test if we started here today and nothing had been done. Here, you have an environmental impact statement that satisfies all the requirements of CEQA. So you have an EIR in front of you that you're prepared to certify uh, or being asked to certify, and in that circumstance, that's not the test at all. It's just the opposite. The test is, uh, you know, has there been an abuse of discretion or a failure to follow the law in somehow um, carrying out the, the, uh, the, the EIR process? But here, you, the EIR has been done. That The studies have been completed. Uh, there's no shortcuts that have been taken. And lastly, on the, the greenhouse gas emissions, and now we're really, I feel like we're in a, in a law school debate, but the Supreme Court said that there are a multitude of ways to comply with CEQA's requirements for analyzing greenhouse gases. And of course, this is a new area and an evolving area, and people that like to challenge projects would love to, to establish that there's just one way to do it, and it's very hard to do, and nobody's ever actually successfully done it even once. But in fact, uh, there are many ways to do it, and the tribe analyzed multiple ways. It doesn't matter which, uh, which way uh, or, or what weight they gave to those various ways. They looked at, it's in the substance of the document. You can read it for yourself if you haven't already. The tribe did look at the consistency of this project with Rancho Mirage's sustainability plan because it sits uh, right next to the border of Rancho Mirage and was contemplated to be annexed into the city of Rancho Mirage. So the tribe took that step. I think it's a good faith step. They also looked at what the county's requirements were. And, and as you sit here today uh, and in your findings, you know, those are bases for the finding that greenhouse gas emissions in this case for this project uh, have been fully mitigated, have been mitigated to a level of less than significant. So that's the evidence in the record on that point. And if there are no questions, that's all I will add on that. Thank you very much for your patience. On Thank this. you. Um, are there any other, any other comments? I just, I think will add just one final comment, and that is that um, this project, the density of this project has been approved, the traffic volumes have been considered, the traffic circulation has been approved. This project's not going to change substantively once it comes under our jurisdiction. Um, if you accept the specific plan, you accept the tentative track map, the only discretion we will have in the end is the preliminary development plan, and that's going to deal with architecture and landscaping, and that has no significant effect on anything other than your eyes. So those are, those are <clears throat> items that are not considered in CEQA or NEPA. All right. Um, I will now close the public portion of the, um, of the item, and I'll return to the city council and ask for 
additional council comments. Mm -hmm. Dana? Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> a couple of points that I'd like to mention. <clears throat> Just a little bit of history as to how we got where we were. <clears throat> this section of land, 24, which is on the west side of Bob Hope, and it's north of um, Dinah Shore, down to Ramon Road, over to Los Alamos. That section uh, is partly tribal. Uh, as a matter of fact, what you're looking at on the screen, the tribal portion is the part with the lines going through it. And that is the part that is owned by the tribe and that's not affected by anything we do now or anything we'll ever do unless they wish to be uh, uh, partners with us in some future uh, arrangement. The project we're looking at is in the beige. All of that land within that uh, boundary between Ramon, Los Alamos, Dinah Shore, and Bob Hope is in what is referred to as the Rancho Mirage sphere of influence. It is not land that is in the city of Rancho Mirage. Many people think it is because land all around it is, but it's not. And because it's not, it comes under different jurisdictions. It comes under the jurisdiction of the county, and it comes under the jurisdiction of the Agua Caliente Band of Cahuilla Indians. So between those two jurisdictions, they decide what goes on that property. Not the city of Rancho Mirage. We don't have a word to say about it. We can complain, we can make suggestions, but we could not foist anything on anybody dealing with that property because it is not in the city. It's not subject to our laws. <clears throat> now, we come to the situation that there's a development that uh, would like to get in the city of Rancho Mirage. Our leverage is, well, unless you comply with some terms, not everything that we would have asked for perhaps initially, if we had been the original uh, jurisdiction to uh, grant uh, make decisions regarding these various issues. But if you want to get into the city and be part uh, and advertise your property as within the city of Rancho Mirage, you have to make some accommodations with us. And so for the last two years, we have been meeting with the representatives of Pulte, our subcommittee and our staff. We've been meeting with the representatives of Pulte, pushing and pulling, both sides doing what they could, and each time we'd finish a meeting, we'd be a little bit closer to some kind of an agreement, but never all the way there. It took a long time for us to get where we are today. So for where we are today, a lot of things will be different, improved from the perspective of Rancho Mirage, more like Rancho Mirage, because the, of the agreements that we've made with Pulte. The, the uh, separation of buildings, the number of buildings, uh, the housing, there's going to be 1,200 residents in that property, and we don't want it to look like it's a crowded development. So we've gone, we spent a lot of time working with them to try to create areas of greenness, open space, and so forth. So until it gets out of our sphere of influence, it's uh, nothing we can compel. Now, we've come to an agreement informally that will either be approved or rejected today. We've come to an agreement that Pulte will seek for the city to annex it, and in return, Pulte gives us the points that we have negotiated. We will now make application with LAFCO, a county organization, and they will decide whether or not the brown colored land that you looked at before, the Pulte land only, not the tribal land, but whether that brownish area, Pulte project location, is to be annexed to the city. If it goes as we believe it will, LAFCO will approve the annexation with the city. And at that point in time, the development will, if not previously in anticipation of that, but the development will, will begin and it will begin in the city of Rancho Mirage. So that's how we got to where we are. Uh, a point that uh, is important uh, to me is that the thing that I dislike most about the project is that it is a project that will be limited to residents 55 years or older. 
To me, that's contraindicated of what the city of Rancho Mirage is and has been and stands for. Yes, our demographics are somewhat older than uh, surrounding cities, but we are not, and we do not consider ourselves to be an elderly community. I mean, the, I only wear a mask so I can appear wise. I'm, I look a whole lot younger when I'm not here on the stage. And uh, in my view, the city of Rancho Mirage should not have age limits or restrictions that prohibit selling homes to people under a certain age. And in that regard, I'd like to say that I'm asking our city manager and our city attorney to draft an ordinance that uh, we can consider as a council and I hope implement that says that there shall be no age restricted properties in the city of Rancho Mirage, developed in the city of Rancho Mirage in the future. Um, had we anticipated this issue some time ago, Pulte wouldn't be here because I would have personally uh, been sponsoring uh, such an ordinance uh, that uh, <coughs> changes the composition of, of our city. Uh, we want kids here, we want young adults, we want old adults, we want everybody. We want <clears throat> gender neutral, we don't care about anything. We want this city to be available and enticing to everyone. And uh, <clears throat> so I hope that we move in that direction down the road. One last issue. There will be, and there should be, comment from people saying how can't with the water conditions and the water supplies and the shortages that we're facing and all of the increased risk uh, rates that we're having uh, that uh, how can you have how can you approve something uh, that is going to have 1200 more homes uh, taking water out of our system well the answer to that question is it's not it's not with any pleasure that we do that uh, on the other hand we can't do anything about it it's not our issue to determine. It's between the tribe Pulte and uh, the CVWD, and the CVWD has made a special arrangements uh, with the city going back uh, several years now, where water will be coming from a reservoir on the north side of the freeway in the hills. The property, <clears throat> the water will be coming down a couple of pipes to uh, supply section 24 and section 19 across the street, as well as inland section 30 uh, that has had water problems that's uh, prevented development over the past few years. So the water issue is something that is simply part of the uh, part of the scene that over which we have no control. And uh, I do want people to know that we are very much uh, concerned about the water shortages and water preservation but this is an issue that's beyond our control. And so with that, uh, Mr. Mayor, if I may, I'd make a motion. Please do. Do you want to have further discussion, perhaps? Does, does anybody have any other comments before a motion is made? Please continue. Okay. <clears throat> I would move that the uh, City Council adopt the resolution approving the use of the Tribal Environmental Impact Statement regarding the city's adoption of the tribe approved section 24 specific plan, approval of the tribe approved tentative track map, and proposed annexation of 320 acres of the section 24 specific plan for the development of an active adult project instead of preparing an environmental impact report. And I move that we adopt the resolution approving the submission of an application to the Riverside Local Agency Formation Commission, LAFCO, to annex to the city of Rancho Mirage approximately 320 acres of the Section 24 specific plan for the development of an active adult project. And three, I would move that the City Council approve the amendment to the Section 24 Entitlement Processing Agreement with Pulte Homes and SCC, Rancho Mirage Holdings. And plus, I think that this, the uh, City Attorney wants us to adopt the findings. Um, I beg your pardon? The additional findings. The additional findings that were read into the record by uh, City um, uh, City Attorney Steve Quintanilla. And I would second that. We have a, a motion. We have a second. Please vote. And the motion is approved five to zero. Uh, we now, uh, I'd like to uh, turn it over to the city attorney regarding the closed session. 
Okay. Mr. Mayor, the City Council is now going to recess in a closed session pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9D4. Regarding two potential cases, the Council will also discuss the case of Veronica Juarez versus City of Rancho Mirage for, uh, pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9D1. All right. The, uh, we will now recess to the closed session. Thank you.